So colleagues, good morning and welcome to the Usher Institute's COVID-19 webinar series. This is the 15th in our series and I'm, I'm really pleased to welcome you this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Linda Bold, I'm a Professor of Public Health here in the Usher. Um, and thanks in advance to our Director, Professor Aziz Sheikh and to the Usher Comms team, uh, both involved in, in setting up and coordinating these webinars. So today I'm really delighted that we're hearing from our colleagues in South Africa, looking at the trajectory of the pandemic there and public health measures to address it, including a temporary ban on alcohol sales. And um, just to remind people, uh, I imagine uh, some of you have joined this webinar series before, but if you haven't, um, you're able to ask questions if you registered and you're using the Zoom uh, webinar tool. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Please do put any questions for either of our two speakers into that box, not in the chat box, which is separate. So into the Q&A box. I'll be watching those questions as they come through. Please do click on a thumbs up if somebody else, else asks a question you'd particularly like answered. So the way we're going to run this webinar is we'll hear first from uh, Cheryl Cohen, who I'll introduce in a moment, and secondly from Charles Perry, two expert colleagues with different areas of expertise. Um, we're gonna have the first and second speaker, one after the other, and then we'll have our hopefully full 20 minutes for questions at the end. So in terms of introducing our speakers, uh, Cheryl Cohen is Associate Professor in Epidemiology at the University of Witwatersrand and head of the Center for Respiratory Disease, uh, Diseases and Meningitis. Uh, she has a background as a medical doctor, and she's also a fellow of the College of Pathologists of South Africa in the discipline of microbiology. Um, in relation to COVID-19, she's been very active in South Africa, and she has an, a part of, uh, she set up a national surveillance program for severe acute respiratory infections in South Africa from 2009, so ideally placed to contribute at the current time. She's a member of several national advisory committees, as, all, as well as several WHO working groups, mainly related to respiratory viruses. So she'll give us an overview on what's happening with COVID-19. And then our second speaker, Professor Charles Perry, is the director of the Alcohol, Tobacco and Other Drug Research Unit at the South African Medical Research Council. He also has a chair in psychiatry at Stellenbosch University. He's a registered clinical and research psychologist trained in South Africa and the USA. Um, he also has contributed to work through the World Health Organization in relation to their expert panel on drug dependence. He's also done work on HIV TB treatment, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. He's highly active in the alcohol policy field. Um, and he's also a, a member of the Academy of Sciences of South Africa and supports work at the University of Edinburgh through uh, the Spectrum Consortium. And he's on our advisory group. So thank you very much to both our speakers. Really delighted. And um, so I'll hand over to our first speaker now, uh, Cheryl Cohen and um, who will start screen sharing, I think, in a moment. Thanks, Cheryl. Perfect. Okay, Th thanks. Thanks, Linda. Um, and thanks for that uh, introduction. Um, as, as Linda mentioned, um, I, I head the Center for Respiratory Diseases and Meningitis at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. So we are a, a national public health institute in South Africa, um, and, and therefore we're really responsible for many areas of surveillance and epidemiology um, related to this COVID epidemic. Um, and really I've quite limited time to, to, to give you a bit of a cook's tour of, of the epidemic evolution in South Africa. So I, I will go quite fast because I want to cover a number of areas, but I'll start off just with a little bit of background about South Africa um, and, and relevant facts in terms of understanding the response and evolution of the epidemic. Um, then I'll spend most of the time really taking you through the trajectory of the epidemic and, and highlighting just a few uh, key areas. Um, and then towards the end, I'll, I'll present some data, uh, unpublished data on, on comorbidities that, that I think might be of interest to this audience. And, and lastly, just a couple of slides on, on ongoing research in South Africa, because I was asked to also uh, touch on that area. So, no, sorry, I don't know. Um, so, so South Africa, um, you can see the map in the bottom left, for those of you who don't know where we are, we, we are situated at the bottom most uh, tip of the African uh, continent. Um, we, we have a temperate climate, and what that means is that we're currently in the Southern Hemisphere winter, as we are going through really the, the, the first wave of the COVID epidemic. 
We're a middle income country, but there are very high levels of, of inequality in South Africa. And the unemployment um, is estimated to be really over 30% of people uh, that are unemployed and, and a large percent of, of people in, in informal or day-to-day or -day subsistence type employment. A population of, of uh, 58 million, um, importantly in terms of COVID, we have a very young population. The life expectancy in South Africa is only 64 years and only 5% of the population is aged greater than 65 years. And I think this is one of the factors which it is expected may potentially to an extent mitigate the severe impact of COVID in South Africa and on the African continent. But in um, counterpoint to that, we have an extremely high burden of communicable diseases um, in South Africa, and particularly uh, tuberculosis with more than 500,000 new cases each year, and even more importantly, perhaps HIV. Um, and, and of course, it is these uh, communicable disease epidemics, in fact, which, which are the major contributor to our low uh, life expectancy in South Africa. And, and I've really just put at the bottom right hand uh, slide uh, or side of the slide, a uh, graph which I often use um, in, in talks that I give about respiratory disease in South Africa. And, and that figure, which you can see in the bottom right, really shows the number of deaths in South Africa by year and month um, from 1997 to 2013. And the deaths are broken out by age group, I'm not sure if you can all see the legend, but you will certainly, I'm sure, see the, the, the red line that is mortality in people aged 20 to 44 years in South Africa. Um, first, you can see that the data are very seasonal. The deaths are seasonal. That's because many, most deaths, a lot of deaths occur in winter due to respiratory disease, which is my focus. But for today, I'd really like you just to focus on the trajectory of, of those deaths. And, and really, of course, this huge epidemic of mortality in young people in South Africa is as a result of HIV. And I, I just wanted to start by, by reminding this audience that in fact, for South Africa, a pandemic is not something new. We, we have lived through a pandemic with an enormous mortality impact in the recent history in South Africa. And just to highlight at the peak of the HIV epidemic in 2006, 280,000 people were estimated to have died of HIV. And even in 2018, with on the left-hand side, you can see really the success of our antiretroviral program, even in that year, um, more than 70,000 people estimated to have died of HIV. And you'll see later on, in fact, these numbers are really even lower than what is expected from COVID. And I think just, so, so I think, um, you know, that, that has an impact in terms of how society thinks about pandemics. And, and from my personal experience as a doctor, uh, you know, I graduated from medical school in, in late 1990s, 2000s. And my early experience as a clinician, I think really were what, what drove me to public health. And those were experiences of working in hospitals in the face of an epidemic with an overwhelmed health system and with many people coming in with a fatal illness and, and, and really not being able to, to save them or give them the care that, that is life-saving. And I do think while there are many, many differences between the HIV epidemic and COVID, there also are a number of, of similarities and one really sees this in, 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 in the healthcare workers that are struggling on the front line of this uh, pandemic. And just lastly, on, on the nature of HIV, there's many, many HIV deaths. Just to remind you, a minority of them would ever have been recorded on the death certificate of HIV. And so really we see the signature of these pandemics in mortality trends, but not necessarily having each of these cases be diagnosed with the disease. So stepping back uh, to perhaps a little bit of a busy slide that really uh, shows you the trajectory of the COVID epidemic in South Africa. And in South Africa, as similar to the rest of Africa, the epidemic reached our shores relatively late. And this is not unexpected because Africa is in general much less connected with Asia and the rest of the world than, than um, other parts of the world. We don't think that in South Africa in particular, we did have quite an active testing program. So we don't, we may have missed it, uh, but we don't think we, we enormously missed it you know, more than any other countries the first case. But the first case that was diagnosed in South Africa was on the 5th of March. And this was very rapidly announced by a Minister of Health. And you can see there um, on the left-hand side, the Minister of Health, Dr. Zweli Mkhize of South Africa, who really throughout this epidemic has characterized his approach um, and in contrast to the, the, the presentations we saw last week from, from Latin America, um, really with a, with a very, very proactive approach to COVID, taking the epidemic very seriously and trying, you know, really right from the start, I think, to engage with the scientific community and make recommendations based on evidence as, as much as was possible, uh, although there have been certain lapses and the government has been criticized in certain areas. I think in general, attitude has really been to be proactive and work with, with scientists. So Zweli and Mkhizi announced the epidemic on the 5th of March, and you can see now, uh, following what, what now in, in the face of our, our huge epidemic curve looks like a very small um, trajectory, 
uh, of cases. Um, this was followed by an announcement by our president, Cyril Ramaphosa, on the 28th of March of a national state of disaster. And they used these regulations, this framework, to Im Im impose very strong travel restrictions and a national lockdown where only essential services were allowed to, to go to work. So essentially the vast majority of people in South Africa were confined to their homes, um, allowed out for very limited times and only to go to, to for essential services for, for six weeks. And I think what was unusual perhaps about our national lockdown was, was how early it was imposed. So, so it was really quite early in the epidemic trajectory that we shut things down. Um, and, and essentially, so, and I'll show you in the next few slides that, that, that certainly that did have an impact on the epidemic. But I think even then, and certainly now, there, there are questions about, um, you know, we, we locked down early, and now, as you can see by the graph, the epidemic trajectory is increasing. And, and what does this mean in terms of potentials for, for, for future lockdowns? I think what I can say is that the lockdown was effective, and I'll show you, you now some data on that, but it also had a very large economic and social impact. And it was very, very difficult, especially for poor people, to survive uh, through these these six weeks. And, and as a result of this, even though the epidemic trajectory continued to increase, increase you can see on the, the, the uh, figure that there was a progressive opening up of society with a drop to level four at the beginning of May and then a level three lockdown at the, at the beginning of June. We're now in South Africa, the schools are open, most workplaces are open, um, and, and, and the society is essentially progressively opening up while the epidemic trajectory increases. And the reason for this opening up is because the economic hardship uh, that has been experienced by people is, was really very, very great. And, and it's, it's difficult to know how to proceed. So this is just some data to, to, to look at perhaps how, how did the lockdown impact? This is from our, our group at the NICD. Essentially, we estimated the, the reproductive number uh, based on, on laboratory testing data and the trajectory of confirmed cases. We did adjust these data for, for um, stock out of, of tests. Um, and, and backfill it. Um, and we also use the date of symptom onset to, to, to correct for delays uh, in, in specimen collection. And what you can see at the bottom is really that, that we estimate certainly in the early phases when the epidemic was mostly imported cases, the reproductive number was around between 2.5 and 3. But it does appear that the national lockdown had a big impact in terms of reducing transmission with the reproductive number going down to around 1.5 and staying there. Um, you will notice, however, that we, we don't have reproductive number estimates into June or more recently as society has opened up with level three. And the reason for this is that, in fact, um, subsequent to, to June, um, the, the testing capacity within South Africa was reached. And so, so the number of the trajectory of cases um, slowed, but not as a result of actual case numbers reducing, but because of, of testing biases. And so we've not been able to reproduce this analysis, although we're working on, on different approaches to estimating the reproductive number, which perhaps uh, correct for this. But, but I think this really suggests the lockdown had an impact. And this figure, which I mean, anyone can go on the internet and download, which just shows the essentially the, the rate of increase in cases in South Africa compared to a few other cases or countries throughout the world. Um, and you can see here that, that South Africa in the red, second from the bottom, has this very unusual flat trajectory where initially the case acceleration was relatively slow and now it's picking up. And this is in contrast, for example, to the United Kingdom, where cases went up very fast and then slowed as a result of the lockdown. So, so this is what happens with an early lockdown. And, and, and now we're in the situation, what do we do uh, with these high, rapidly increasing cases at this time? Um, I just made two slides with sort of general personal reflections on some of the strengths and, and limitations of the response. I think that the, the biggest strength of our response has in general been strong political leadership, although there have been some areas in which government certainly has been criticized. But I do think our president and our minister of health certainly took the epidemic very seriously and in general really tried to, to, to respond in the best possible way. I think on the right, you can see another big strength of South Africa is that we do have a, a strong laboratory infra infrastructure, certainly on the African continent. Uh, we have probably the strongest infrastructure, and this is mostly driven by our history of communicable disease epidemics, particularly HIV and TB, where we have huge testing programs for, for molecular diagnostics, the gene expert for tuberculosis, HIV viral loads, etc. And this uh, very large PCR testing uh, capacity could, to an extent, be rolled over to allow for COVID uh, testing. And there was also a very strong uh, will from civil society to, to work with government and contribute in terms of technological solutions, dashboards, apps, and, and, and a real attempt from, from people from all sectors to really try and, and support 
the epidemic. And then lastly, on the bottom right, uh, you can see, well, I've mentioned the time to prepare. I think that the early lockdown did flatten the rate of increase early on in the epidemic. And this did buy us time to prepare our health services. The, the picture there that you can see is the Cape Town International Convention Center. Some of you may have visited this in happier times, but it's now been converted into a field hospital uh, for COVID cases. Um, there have been challenges, particularly staffing this field hospital, but, but in some provinces, um, they did use the time to strengthen health infrastructure. I think that the limiting factor is that there's only so much that one can do on top of the existing health service. But there were many challenges. We had a lot of outbreaks early on in healthcare facilities, um, but perhaps most of the challenges were really driven by economic issues. I mean, in the middle picture, you can see people really queuing for food under the lockdown. So many, many people in South Africa live on social grants. That's the second commonest source of income in South Africa, in fact, is grants from the government for pension, for childcare, and, and, and people live from day-to-day -day wages. So, so the lockdown, the closing of society, put many people in a fragile state into a situation of, of hunger and food insecurity. At the right-hand side, you can see pension day in a, in a town in the Eastern Cape. This is under the national lockdown, the huge crowds of people, because people have to come out and get their pensions. This is the money that they survive on, and perhaps the planning of this uh, delivery wasn't particularly good in this town. And then on the bottom left, uh, you really need to highlight the, the poor living conditions of, of many people. It, it's very easy for WHO and other organizations to say, well, people must physically distance, they must wash their hands. But when you're living in the type of, of circumstance depicted in the picture with, with, with communal toilets, communal shacks in, in a very small shack, many people living together, it is genuinely very difficult to physically distance um, and to, to take on uh, these measures. Um, I, think, I think while we had a strong laboratory testing capacity, we also um, had challenges with supply of reagents. Um, and also, uh, I think in general, while we, South Africa made a very strong effort in contact tracing and, and contact tracing has been ongoing, I think really from very early in the epidemic, it was apparent that in a setting such as ours, that the WHO recommended strategy really of find every case, test every case, follow up all the contacts, was ju is just really perhaps not well suited to implementation in, in an African uh, type of setting like ours. And I do, I do think, um, you know, especially when people are living in these informal settings, they don't have access to healthcare, it's very difficult, in fact, to keep up with the testing and the contact tracing. Um, just one slide to highlight the, the role of, of the laboratory and our laboratory, particularly at the, the NICD. Um, we're a, a national and regional uh, COVID uh, reference laboratory. In the beginning of the epidemic, we were the only testing laboratory in South Africa, but we rapidly um, developed a lot more infrastructure within the country, and we worked with other African countries, initially testing for them, and then, uh, you know, now most African countries do their own testing, mostly built on the, inf the influenza surveillance uh, infrastructure, and we now act as a reference laboratory, particularly in areas of serology, whole genome sequencing, and PCR, and also um, quality assurance programs with other countries. And I think the laboratory side of the COVID response on the continent has been a very important a component and, and a real challenge for many African countries. I wanted to just briefly touch on, on the role of modeling. I think this is another area that's been very important within South Africa. And again, highlighted that, that our government did try to, to, to you know, use the available uh, technologies and epidemiologic approaches available to them. South Africa has a, a COVID-19 modeling a consortium. Uh, it's essentially a number of different modeling groups coordinated by uh, the, the NICD, where I work with advice from, from uh, people from other sectors. This, this graph just shows some of the, um, the projections uh, from these models. Just to highlight, so you see the cases, the hospital beds, I think that that, that model is actually uh, the line which shows the, the hospital beds suggesting we won't reach our hospital capacity. Is in fact, this is an old slide. In fact, um, you know, we are currently breaching the hospital bed capacity in, in, in a number of provinces now. And you can see the ICU beds really showing that our ICU bed threshold is, it is currently breached and, and uh, you know, the epidemic, if allowed to progress, will, will enormously exceed the ICU bed capacity. It's important to note that the major limiting factor on ICU is not actually physical beds, it's healthcare workers, trained healthcare workers to man those beds. So we cannot expand our ICU capacity more by buying ventilators, et cetera, because we just don't have healthcare workers with the skills to operate ICU beds. So the focus in South Africa is really on ho hospitals and oxygen. Um, and, you know, but, but it's really a minority of cases that will get into ICU. There's a very strong uh, triage procedure. And the model suggests about 40,000 deaths for South Africa. I personally feel that's a very conservative estimate, uh, but that's what they're working on for now. 
On this slide, I won't dwell on it, but just to, to really show you that, that the modeling consortium has worked very, very closely with many areas of government to really facilitate planning in terms of procurement, budget, numbers of beds needed, et cetera, with all the provinces. And I think, again, this is one of the, the strengths of our uh, response. Um, I think of, of a big concern is the impact on, on other diseases. And I'm just focusing on communicable diseases in this presentation. These are data from, from the NICD, just looking at two areas. One is the number of, of TB tests done in South Africa. And you can see really TB diagnostics under the lockdown. And, and since COVID, the number of people accessing to TB diagnosis has dropped hugely. On the right, you see cryptococcal antigen testing. This is a screening test done on people uh, who, who come in with a CD4, a CD4 count for, for AIDS uh, to test if they have cryptococcal meningitis. And again, these programs have just uh, hugely dropped. And there are projections that suggest that, that, that it is likely that more people may die, in fact, in South Africa of HIV and tuberculosis from um, the, the uh, negative impact on these long-term uh, services um, as a result of COVID, although, although now government is really trying to push to get people back to, to the clinic, back into care. I think there's obviously a lot of uh, hesitance within the population. I mean, I just, because we're in the Southern Hemisphere, I thought it'd be interesting to show our influenza and respiratory syncytial virus data. Essentially, this has been an unprecedented year. I've been working in this influenza and RSV surveillance for many, many years. Um, and, and really, we've never seen anything like this. On the left, you see influenza. It is right now is normally our influenza season in the winter. Um, in 2020, we had a very unseasonal outbreak. In fact, in the summer, in January and February, which you can see there on the bottom left-hand graph in 2020. But essentially, uh, from the start of the national lockdown, and um, we've not seen hardly any influenza in South Africa. Through our routine surveillance, we've had only one influenza detected. And even in the private sector, very tiny numbers of, of influenza cases detected. And normally we'd be in the peak of our influenza season now, but, but, but really we're not seeing any influenza circulation. And on the right, you see respiratory syncytial virus. Our RSV season is usually February, March, April. And um, this year, we, we didn't even breach the seasonal threshold for RSV. So we have had some low level RSV circulation. But, but really at, at very, very low and unprecedented levels. And clearly lockdowns, physical distancing, masks, they do have a big impact on, on other Just to, to move on um, to, 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 I just thought I'd briefly take the opportunity to present some um, unpublished data on comorbidities and COVID, specifically focusing on HIV and uh, tuberculosis. Um, because clearly with, with our huge population, more than 7 million people HIV infected, it's a big public health concern as to what is the extent of increased risk, uh, or is there any increased risk of severe outcomes in HIV infected individuals? This is a very busy slide. Don't look at the details. It's just to remind me to say that in the Western Cape province, which really was the, the first province to be severely affected by the epidemic, they have a quite a unique and very strong health information system infrastructure um, with, with, with unique identifiers that allow them to track uh, people through all contacts in the health service, uh, whether it be outpatients, hospitalizations, um, et cetera. And, and this allows them to, to create essentially a, a synthetic cohort of more than 3 million people uh, in, in that province, um, which, are, which is well characterized in terms of HIV and other comorbidities. And, and essentially what they, they did early on in the epidemic was use the synthetic cohort to, to examine the association between people who do have different underlying illnesses and uh, death as a result of COVID. And I'll just show you in the next slide some of the, the results. Um, so so this is just a, a multivariable analysis, really looking at factors associated with death uh, due to COVID in the Western Cape, in the public sector. Um, so, so it's really looking in, in the general population, uh, what is the association of different comorbidities and death? And you can see most of the results very similar to other countries, male sex, age being very, very strong risk factors, diabetes and kidney disease coming very strongly in this series. And then towards the bottom, you see really this association with HIV of about two times increased odds of death in HIV infected uh, people. Just for context, this is much lower than what we would see, for example, with, with influenza um, uh, or, or other pathogens. It's something like pneumococcus might be as high as 20 times increased odds. So there is an increased odds, but, but to some extent lower than what we see with, with many other pathogens. They wanted to look at, at the effect of age on this. So, so is this increased effect uh, uh, you know, seen in people of all ages? And what they noted is that the, this, the increased odds of, of mortality is mostly seen in people under the age of 55 years. Amongst people greater than and equal to 55, there, there's really not the significant increased association with mortality. Again, this association we've described previously with influenza and, and other respiratory viruses, it does seem that the, the uh, excess risk conferred 
HIV manifests in young people who don't have much intrinsic risk of severe outcomes. But in, in older people, um, it has less of an effect. And then perhaps the, the question everyone is interested in is what is the association with immunosuppression and this increased risk in this data set? It appeared that there wasn't really a strong trend. In other words, whether you were, were well on antiretrovirals or whether you were highly immunosuppressed, there didn't, didn't seem to be a clear trend of increased risk in people who were severely immunosuppressed. Just to caution, the Western Cape province is the, the most, uh, the, the country with the most successful HIV treatment program in South Africa. And so I think these data are preliminary. As the epidemic spreads to, to provinces where, where the HIV program is not as strong and where there are more people with AIDS and severe immunosuppression, I think there may be more data for us to examine this association in more depth. And this is just one last slide from, from a, a different surveillance program looking at a similar question. This is our, our uh, the NICD a DACOV surveillance program for hospitalized people with COVID. We have more than 10,000 people um, in this database, all admitted to, to hospital with confirmed COVID and um, from all nine provinces now of South Africa. We did a similar analysis, except in a different population. The previous analysis was the general population and mortality. Here we're looking, given hospitalization, what is your risk of a fatal outcome? And, and again, you can see the same factors coming out strongly, uh, male sex, age, really the, the strongest by far risk factor, a range of comorbidities, very important. Um, you can see hypertension, cardiac disease, et cetera. In our analysis, active tuberculosis was associated with a two times increased odds of death and also HIV, slightly lower odds ratio of 1.4, which you would expect because th this is given hospitalization. So the, so the, the the HIV has already contributed to that risk of hospitalization. Um, and, then, and then perhaps at the very bottom, just a, another concerning trend, which is that it does seem that even adjusting for all these other factors, the in-hospital case fatality ratio is increasing with progressive months of the epidemic. And, and this may be as a result of, of perhaps more sick people coming into the hospital, it, it, um, but, but it could also reflect really the, the health systems becoming um, overwhelmed in terms of their capacity to manage uh, COVID cases. Um, and then this is on comorbidity. I'm going to just go quickly because I'm nearly out of time, but just maybe to highlight that, that, that uh, what's interesting is in South Africa, many HIV infected people as the HIV population ages have comorbidity. So 58% of HIV infected people with, uh, you know, actually have another underlying uh, comorbidity in, in our hospitalized uh, data sets. And so we really had to disaggregate the effects of these other comorbidities and, and, and the effects of HIV intrinsically. Just, just, I'll just touch on this one slide on, on research highlights in South Africa. Really, there's a lot of research going on in South Africa. Um, and I think we have very strong infrastructure perhaps to, to produce information that, that can help inform the response in other parts of Africa. I've already shown you how our surveillance platforms can provide useful data. There's a lot going on on the serology side. We're doing at our institute a number of studies really looking specifically at HIV infected people, looking at uh, whether they shed for longer, looking at whether HIV infected people perhaps transmit virus more. And then there's also a vaccine trials happening in South Africa. The, the CHAD-5 trial has launched. And in fact, they had to shut down the recruitment sites in the first week because there were so many uh, volunteers wanting to be part of the study. Um, I think I'm out of time. So th this, this slide was really um, just to, to highlight one study that we're doing that, that, that's quite unique. It's a, it's a cohort study um, of, people, a thousand people in a rural and an urban community, really um, perhaps an ambitious study aiming to, to understand uh, two things, really the incidence of infection with COVID, uh, both symptomatic and asymptomatic, and then to really look at whether uh, people infected, how, how, to what extent people infected with COVID transmit within their household, again, from both as, asymptomatic and symptomatic people. Essentially, we enroll a thousand people and we swab them twice a week and we do a PCR on them irrespective of symptoms, along with collecting symptom data and health visit data. And so we can really, by, by swabbing people twice a week for six months, uh, we can really document introduction of infection into homes, even asymptomatic infection into homes, and then how it transmits and spreads um, within the, those homes. And, and, and so, so it's quite an ambitious a cohort study, um, you know, because it really relies on having sufficient rates of infection in the, in the community to get enough inter interactions into households. But if it's successful, the, this, this platform uh, will, will fairly uniquely allow us to really understand transmission from asymptomatic and symptomatic individuals and also the role of children and HIV infected people in, in driving transmission, which perhaps will help us to tailor our policies on school closure, et cetera. Because again, in a situation like South Africa, the impact on education is, is severe. 
so, so this I'm just ending off. Uh, this is just to say, right at the current minute, really uh, in a number of provinces of South Africa, Western Cape, uh, Eastern Cape, Gauteng, where I am, where Johannesburg is, um, the, the epidemic trajectory is increasing, and there are increasing reports of hospitals, in fact, being full. On the top left, you see that the, the national t testing capacity seems to have reached its limit in the last month. So 35,000 tests a week seem to be the, the maximum limit that we can reach in terms of testing, and, and the epidemic uh, continues to progress. And, and in my final uh, slide, I just wanted to, to talk to that, because my, my current role in the epidemic is really to, to uh, coordinate all of our surveillance programs at the NICD for tracking the epidemic. And I think, I think it does pose a, a real problem when firstly your testing capacity is, is exceeded and then the capacity of the hospitals is exceeded. So first you count cases, then you move to hospitalizations as a more robust indicator, but then even uh, when the hospitals are full, uh, they're full. And I think I just wanted to end on the, this last slide, which is data from the Medical Research Council, which is tracking uh, excess mortality in natural deaths. So these are deaths, not deaths coded as COVID, but just counting the number of natural deaths by week in real time in South Africa. And you can see the, the trajectory in these two, two sample uh, affected areas, the trajectory of increasing mortality and, and a, a sort of crude estimation that they estimate about 5,000 excess natural deaths uh, so far. And I think it, it, it really becomes apparent that similar to HIV in the end, we'll be left with, with really, uh, you know, unfortunately having to track that, that mortality trajectory to, to allow us to really understand the, the truth of the huge um, and, and terrible impact of this uh, pandemic. So, so thanks very much. Um, just to say, uh, there's a, we, we do actually publish a lot on our website in terms of guidance um, and reports, and you can have a look if you'd like to, to see any more information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That was uh, absolutely fantastic. And if only we've been able to give you more time to go through all those data. I'm sure we'll want to come back to that cohort study and other things when we have the discussion. So thank you. I'm going to hand over now to Charles to share his screen and provide his presentation. Thanks very much. I'll be with you now. Give me a second here. Okay, uh, I've got a slide. Sorry, uh, I'm just going to move this out the way. Okay. You seeing it full screen? Yep, got it now. Perfect. Thanks very much. Okay, and I'm going to block this up there. Okay, um, what I'm going to be, we're going to be changing tr track here. That was that was very interesting, Cheryl. And I'm going to be talking specifically about the ban, the temporary ban on alcohol sales during levels four and five of the COVID-19 lockdown in South Africa and talk a bit about lessons learned. And um, we were fairly unique in that. We're one of a few countries really to have a very, uh, a ban on alcohol sales during this time. Um, this slide you might have seen, I think it comes from a few days ago in the Financial Times, slightly different from the one that Cheryl showed, showing the seven-day rolling average of new cases by number of days since 10 average cases was first recorded, showing South African comparison to United States and United Kingdom. Certainly, we, we're one of the countries with facing a lot of challenges. So I think it's important when we're looking at alcohol and the link with COVID-19 to look at where the linkages are. And I've always talked about um, four linkages. Um, firstly, that drinking increases the risk for community transmission. Drinking is a very social phenomenon. People drink with, with friends. And so that increases the risk for the virus to spread. Secondly, when people are drinking, and particularly if, they, if they're in lockdown, it can also increase the risk in general, but also particularly in lockdown for interpersonal violence and especially gender-based violence. Thirdly, alcohol in use increases the risk for alcohol-related trauma, which puts pressure on our hospital resources, which, as Cheryl was showing, are currently under extreme pressure for ICU resources right now. And fourthly, we don't hear too much about it, and it's not as strong as with smoking, but heavy drinking. The heavy drinking part increases the risk for compromised lung health and immunity. And there's a fifth reason, which I'll come to later, so I'll keep that waiting. Um, so why did we have a temporary ban on alcohol sales in South Africa? Um, let's, a little bit of context, Cheryl gave a bit of bigger context for South Africa. We're looking at drinking. About a third of adult population drink, but about five to six out of every 10 drinkers engage in heavy episodic or binge drinking, that's 60 grams on a single occasion um, during the past month. So we're not like drinkers, those of us who do drink. Um, we're also the sixth highest country globally in terms of the amount of, of alcohol, pure alcohol in grams, drunk 
per drinker per day at about 64 grams, which is between five and six standard drinks in South Africa. And we have about 62,000 alcohol-related deaths each year, or about 170 per day. The reasons that were particularly given by government ministers related to um, reducing um, the, the burden on our, on our hospitals, and secondly, uh, th there's a known link with alcohol and crime and, and dealing with that problem. So the police wouldn't be dealing with, with alcohol-related crime, but they'd be focusing on more the controlling the population during the disaster management regulations, which I'll talk about next. So the next slide, um, Cheryl's also touched a bit on this briefly, the phases of the lockdown in South Africa. The, we had a, a period which we, which we call lockdown light, which was from the 19th to the 26th of March, which really was re focusing on restricting the hours of the day when people could could buy alcohol, both at on and off consumption outlets. And if you were buying at an on consumption outlet during that time, you had to do it before six o'clock in the evening and that you weren't allowed to have more than 50 people in that bar or restaurant. But then on the, on the 27th of March, we started a, a very hard lockdown, which among other things included a complete ban on the sale of liquor. Um, um, during the 66-day lockdown and no transportation of liquor at all. It didn't mean alcohol was prohibited. Prohibited. You could, um, if you had it in your home, you could drink it. And if you wanted to brew your own, you could also do that. There were also extreme limitations, as Cheryl has talked about, on movement, people going to work. And interestingly enough, alcohol was declared non-essential. Um, there was some easing of movement for work and exercise in level four um, at the beginning of, uh, at the, uh, yeah, at, at the middle of that period. But um, there was also a curfew installed between 8 p.m. at night and 5 a.m. in the morning. Then on the 1st of June, we moved to level three. And the, uh, the idea was that the ban on alcohol sales was lifted. It can now be sold from both on and off consumption outlets, but only for off sales use. You can't drink alcohol. And we're currently in level three, you can't drink alcohol on at an outlet, but both all the 200, sorry, 25,000 um, off consumption outlets and the about 65,000 off consumption outlets were allowed to sell alcohol for people to take it away, um, but limited, hours and days of sale from uh, eight from nine o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the evening only Mondays to Thursdays and not uh, weekends public holidays transportation is only allowed of liquor on those days and there's a substantial opening up of work movement no curfew and so on Uh, then at the beginning, uh, we'll start off the Easter. Um, some colleagues and I at the Medical Research Council and University of Cape Town did some modeling of alcohol-related trauma admissions because it was going to be clear that there was going to be pressure on our, on our hospital facilities and we have a very high level, level uh, rate of alcohol-related trauma, which we estimated to be about 42,700 trauma admissions per week across just over 350 public secondary and tertiary hospitals. So we're not looking at the primary healthcare facilities, which do deal with some trauma, and also not the private sector. Uh, from several research studies over many years, we, we, we reckon that about 40% or 17,000 in a normal situation per week of, of, alcohol, of trauma would be alcohol related. We saw actually an incredible drop, which was also uh, known in, in many other countries, in trauma admissions during the lockdown, about a 65% drop in trauma admissions due to the various lockdown provisions, the ban on sale of alcohol, plus the extreme restrictions on movement, from the 42,000 to about 15,000 a week. And it's estimated that the, uh, there were less, about 10,000 less alcohol-related admissions. So what our model tried to do was to try to estimate that if the alcohol sales were allowed to take resume, what would happen to trauma admissions? And through a period of consensus making, looking at data that was available, we estimated that about just under half or 48% of the 10,250 alcohol related admissions that had gone away during the severe lockdown would come back. And of those um, coming back, more of them, about 62% of those of the 5,000 would be violence related, 30% from motor vehicles and so on. 
But looking at, at real data, not just our modeling, what, what did we find? And the, probably the best data at the moment is from the Sentinel Trauma Report from the Western Cape Department of Health, which looked at data from five large hospitals from the beginning of January. And you can see below the title, sort of the graph showing that before the lockdown, those hospitals were seeing about 89 trauma admissions uh, uh, per, per day across the five hospitals. During the two month severe lockdown and the alcohol ban, that dropped to about 46 trauma admissions per day. But then in the week preceding the lifting of the, 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 the ban on sales of alcohol for, for off consumption use, it dropped up to 54 per day. And then in the week after the, uh, the ban on alcohol sales was lifted, it jumped to, to about 90, which was as we, and I've done some costing of that because it's a new area of research. And we, rec we calculated that's about um, in an increase of about 5.7 million rand uh, for those hospitals in that one week period. But obviously not all that would be realized because some, some of the costs are still there, um, even if people don't come to the trauma unit. The next slide is from a, a, a very big hospital in Gauteng province near in Johannesburg area called Charlotte Mateche Hospital, reporting the average number seen per day in March, April, and June, reflecting the pre-lockdown, the severe lockdown, and the first week after the ban on alcohol sales was lifted and level th we went into level three for both assaults and motor vehicle uh, injuries. Let's just look at the assault cases. They were seeing on average 16 per day there. It dropped to seven in April and jumped to 22 in the first week of, of June. Um, then this is some work that I, I want to talk about, the fifth possible reason for addressing alcohol as part of COVID-19 response. There's a, a, looking at the cost saving. Obviously, uh, Cheryl has also talked about the extreme cost to the economy of the lockdown, but let's just look in terms of hospital costs. And one of the things I was doing was looking at that 65% drop in trauma admissions, not just looking at alcohol, but all trauma admissions. In, in a single week, we would be saving about 616 million rands across the country because of the, the, um, the trauma admissions that weren't coming in during that time. But looking over the 66 day period, um, my estimations are looking at using the model was about 6 billion rands or 272 million pounds was, was, was the estimated saving. But focusing on the short term savings, which could actually be realized from consumables, pharmaceuticals and goods and services, we're looking at about a 1.5 billion rand or 73 million pounds saving at that point in time. Cheryl has shown a slide here also of the mortality, but I'm looking at the at the whole country, not just certain provinces, and it shows the the um, non natural deaths um, that occurred. The black line is showing the actual number that was recorded during the various phases. The darker brown line is the projected number, and the two dotted lines are a confidence interval around the projected number. And you'll see during levels four and five of the lockdown, a substantial drop. We, in fact, were one of two countries, South Africa and Israel, which reported a, 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 a net negative uh, excess in, in deaths. But clearly, as we've moved into level three and as we go forward, we are also going to see a, you know, a, a large excess of deaths um, running forward. But that was interesting during that particular time of the lockdown. So what uh, in, in terms of some reflections, um, I was certainly encouraged by the government lawyer stating that sale of alcohol is not seen as essential service. And that came in, in a response to a legal challenge by, by some liquor traders. Um, I feel that the public relations exercise for the ban on liquor sales and the link with COVID-19 could have certainly been better. We haven't done a very good job of telling the public exactly the reasons for, for the, the uh, ban on liquor sales and, and the benefits. I think we could have done better there. Um, I think we should have been far more sensitive or responsive to persons with alcohol dependence. They were sort of told to go cold turkey and we didn't really make enough information available on where they could go for counseling, still encouraging to go to go for services and making um, medically assisted treatment available. 
Um, as, a, as someone who's been working in this area, expert opinion, our opinion was initially sought really only to help the government respond to legal challenges. But now, um, from my side, um, we've been consulted far more in terms of giving guidance to government uh, to guide them in, in going forward. Um, I was certainly encouraged by the president's statement on the 18th of June that we need more strategic measures to curb alcohol abuse. And he talked specifically about the link between alcohol and gender-based violence, motor vehicle injuries, and risk in general. And so several doors have opened up to present ideas on addressing alcohol to government and, and the, the, the governing party. The industry has play, downplayed the effect of the liquor ban on trauma admissions and challenged the logic of that. Um, in terms of advocacy, the, the lockdown has certainly helped raise awareness of the burden imposed by alcohol on South African society in the mainstream and in the media, social media. Um, and I think we're, we're not, we're just about back to the level of trauma admissions that we saw before the lockdown, but, but people had gone, got blasé to it. They weren't seeing it anymore. And what the lockdown has done is just to bring this into the spotlight. It's also allowed the issue of what a new normal could be. And it's raised the opportunities for us to, to work together, academic, civil society, to really put on the table what a new normal for alcohol going forward could be. And community voices have also been heard. And there's a very good um, uh, video that's been put out by Sonki Gender Justice recently on, on what it was like during the lockdown and how, how we don't want to go back to a more um, alcohol-related fueled society. In terms of research, the after the first week of reinstatement of liquor sales, we saw the resurgence of alcohol-related trauma admissions. But as I've said too, I um, in some cases not yet back to the levels pre-lockdown, pre but in other cases above that. Uh, it's highlighted for, for me as an alcohol epidemiologist, the need for better capturing of data of trauma admissions and assessing alcohol relatedness going forward. And the last two slides, um, one of the things I've been doing and uh, is putting up a, a list of ideas of what we should be doing from an alcohol policy point of view to address the four areas where alcohol is linked to, to COVID-19. And three of the, the most important ones I believe we should be doing now in level three are we should be looking at imposing a, a ban on the marketing of alcohol, except at points of sale. We should be moving forward with the idea of a, a, a 0.02 level of blood alcohol concentration for drivers. And we should also be looking at perhaps limiting the or banning the sale of alcohol in those larger containers, such as one liter beer cans and bottles, to because uh, those have been particularly linked to heavy drinking. Um, but I think it might be too late to institute to implement some of these now in order to decrease trauma admissions. But there certainly are things we should be talking about going forward as we talk about a new normal. And finally, many people are talking about, are there plans to reinstate an alcohol ban at this time? And certainly the government isn't keen to do so because it wants to open up the economy. But I suspect that with the pressure growing increasingly on, on hospital facilities, ICU facilities, the government may in fact have no choice but to go back to a ban on alcohol sales in order to prevent a, a conflict occurring between do we admit someone who's had a, a stab wound or someone with a COVID-19 situation. So we may well see that going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. That was excellent. And I think it's just testament to the strength of the South African research community that we've been able to see this very broad ranging presentation from both of you. So Cheryl, if you don't mind just popping your video back on, I'll go to the questions now. And um, so I'm gonna start with the most popular one for you here, Cheryl, from uh, uh, Professor Lawrence Grewer. Do you have data comparing COVID-19 case rates and deaths between different ethnic racial groups in South Africa? So I know you showed uh, comorbidities and HIV, et cetera, but any comments on that? So, so I, I don't have data to to present. I think I think race has, has come out as a huge uh, issue in in the United States and and in, in other parts, certainly in the United Kingdom, as well. I mean, South Africa, uh, the collection of, of race data is is somewhat uh, difficult and, and controversial. And so, it, when we first started our, our big surveillance program, in fact, we didn't collect race data. Um, more recently, we we've started collecting those data. Um, and so. We, we're planning to, to release those data going forward, but we don't have it on the full full time series. So, so we recognize that it's important. I, I do think many of the underlying factors are perhaps more social rather than racial, but certainly from South Africa, it would be very interesting. And, and we will look at that in the future, but we haven't released any information yet. 
Okay, great. A lot more questions for you. I'll come back to you. So Charles, just to kick off, I've got some other alcohol questions that were sent to me in advance. Mark Petrick, who's been listening in, you know Mark. And he, if you could give us some more details, please, on the industry response uh, to the ban. Because, of course, the domestic alcohol industry in South Africa is, is very large and powerful. Yes, thank you. I mean, the industry obviously was, I think, caught, caught unawares by the government uh, instituting the ban on liquor sales. And they used various tactics to try to get the government to, to change. I mean, the first, le the first strategy was the, uh, the legal, legal route, and it was done mainly through liquor traders. So I don't know if industry was the big manufacturers were behind it, but I suspect they were. But certainly the first group to come forward and to uh, institute criminal, well, not criminal, a civil, civil action against the government to try to get it released was the, the Gauteng Liquor, um, liquor Traders Association. And um, the government uh, responded to that and fought back. And in fact, the, the court said that um, it, 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 it could remain. Um, other ways they've done it was the beer industry, South African breweries talked about having 132 um, million liters of beer that they were going to have to flush down the down the drain because they had they had they'd started manufacturing they couldn't turn off the taps and they wanted to be able to move it to uh, to um, uh, the 40 uh, uh, places where they store beer and, and then distribute it from there in the end the government allowed them to to move the beer from the the seven breweries to the storage facilities and I think it just brought the awareness of just how much beer is being produced in South Africa 3.2 billion liters per year, that, that one, the 132 million liters was only two weeks worth. Um, the other things you know, that they've done is, is just to sort of, um, I think, use uh, people who are trying to sell alcohol and get their voices heard and saying, we, we can't, we, people are, are not, are not um, able to, to feed their families and that sort of thing. And then, you know, um, you know, other strategies sort of undermining, saying there's no link between alcohol and trauma and really, and, and sort of undermining that argument, which in fact, is, it's very clear that there is a link. Okay, and I'll, I think I'll, I'll ask you, Cheryl, two questions together. The first one is from John Frank. You can probably see it in the Q&A. He said, a striking feature of your epidemic curve is the inordinary slow up, upstroke, even before the lockdown started. <clears throat> so do you think this was related to <clears throat> the stratification of South African society? And then another fundamental question um, is in relation just to the timing of your lockdown. So we are in a situation in the UK where retrospectively we have many voices saying oh we should have locked down earlier and we were all saying it at the time i'm not persuaded they were all saying it at the time but that's what they say now um and uh you know i think the south african case just shows that that's not necessarily the answer it depends on the country so comments on both those things yeah so i think two really really crucial questions i think the first one about the divided nature of society um firstly to say we're now in the area of, of speculation and opinion um, but obviously, this is something that that also not obviously, but certainly we we've discussed and thought about uh, a lot. I, I think absolutely, those of you who visited South Africa will see that that despite uh, you know a huge progress um, since the ad advent of democracy in South Africa, South Africa is still a very divided society, and people do the, the more affluent communities and poorer communities. Uh, you really live in very separate circumstances, although there's a lot of mixing, um, particularly it, through the workforce, through domestic work, etc. But between People. I mean, certainly, I think that's one hypothesis that, that has been discussed, that, that the, the early importations were really amongst the, the most affluent people who could travel mostly to ski resorts in, in Europe and to uh, parties in the United States, so having investigated many of them myself personally. And these affluent people were therefore able to, in fact, uh, quarantine and self-distance in, in, in an effective way. Um, and, and then with the timing of the lockdown, it, 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 you know, I think once, once the epidemic gets out of those affluent communities, uh, you can see what's happening now and that it's very difficult to control, but potentially the early timing of the lockdown may in fact have, have allowed it to still remain for the most part contained in those African communities, a small C in other communities, which obviously eventually have turned into the fire that see, but that is all hypothesis and speculation. And in fact, some people have extended it further to, to think about the Western Cape, really their epidemic took off much faster um, than in other parts of South Africa. And, and there has been discussion about whether perhaps in the Western Cape, you know, in, in Gauteng, for example, most of the returning travelers were South African. In the Western Cape, many tourists moved to South Africa. So whether those tourists, in fact, were staying in hotels and mixing much more intensively with different sectors of society, and could it possibly be that the reason the trajectory took off so fast in the Western Cape was, was again because, um, you know, it was seeded into those poorer communities 
uh, which where it's more difficult to find cases earlier. But again, it's all that is all speculation, and we don't have have evidence on that. I think the question about the early lockdown, it, it's in a sense un, unknowable. I remember amongst many other people, I, I was one of the people consulted about should we lock down now? And, and I, at the time, you know, of course, the, the truth was there be, before us. Do we lock down now knowing that, that we have a limited time, lockdowns can't be sustained forever? Um, and, and what will it mean later? Or, but how can one wait in the face of an epidemic where you know, you know you're not finding all the cases you know you cannot track all the contacts because it's just not possible in our situation. So, so to not lock down is also then to, to, to sort of sit and watch the thing evolve. And so I think, you know, it, the government's decision to lock down early uh, was, was, you know, in the, I mean, the only other option is test and treat and, and to test and contact trace. And so, and you can see it had a huge impact. Social distancing does have an impact. What it means now, it, it's really unknowable. Our hospitals are reaching capacity there's been a huge social impact, and there is there is not an appetite uh, for another lockdown. Um, but of course, we've not seen anywhere in the world what can happen to the epidemic. You know what will conspire. And so I think it's it's really an open question. I know government is considering another lockdown along with other measures. Um, but but I think in a sense, South Africa is it's going to be an experiment, and we'll have to see what happens. But but it's it's not an easy it's not an easy decision. And I don't think you can say our government was wrong, but I don't think one can also know what would have happened otherwise. Yeah, we have a series of natural experiments, don't we, happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. So Charles, a question for you. Do you think the logistics and time required to implement the ban on alcohol and also tobacco, as you know, during lockdown might have distracted government or policymakers from the huge challenge of controlling COVID transmission, for example, the increasing capacity to test and trace, keep transmission low, or was it really different parts of government focusing on these issues? Obviously, it got a lot of attention because there are, you know, a lot of people who, who you know, well, who consume alcohol and, and smoke, and those, you know, they're very upset when they couldn't get get access to it. So it did it did take a lot of attention, certainly in terms of the media. But and again, this is, I mean, picking up on Cheryl's words here, it's speculation. Um, I, you know, I don't think it, it necessarily detracted them. I mean, it took a lot of effort, though. I must say the legal issues, I mean, I've been a little bit involved in, in responding and giving inputs, have taken, you, you can't imagine how many legal cases have been taken out against the government, particularly in the alcohol and tobacco sphere, I mean, and other areas like hairdressers and so on. So they, I think it was over 100, Cheryl maybe can correct me here, but the government's faced a lot of legal challenges, which certainly must have taken, must have distracted a little bit from the ability to address to address the you know the, the pandemic, but um, I, I don't think it was overwhelming. I think they 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 did what they needed to do as well. And I think our our ministers have worked incredibly hard, our cabinet ministers and, and people in local governments and provincial governments too, um, to you know they're they're not sitting back and doing nothing. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try and squeeze in three quick questions for you, primarily Cheryl, but um, Charles might want to comment. So Richard Simpson, um, who is a, a former MSP in our parliament, also a, a clinician, is acting here, asking here about, has the diversion of testing capacity from HIV to COVID had an adverse impact on managing your HIV patients? Um, Peter Rice, this may be as well for you, Charles, is asking about the fact that liver disease, which is predominantly alcohol related here, um, doesn't look like it's the same risk for COVID as it is here, as it is in South Africa. So for us, it's a higher risk factor than diabetes, kidney disease, and uh, ischemic heart disease. And then Helen Stagg, who's a TB specialist, is saying that she sees that active TB flags as a risk factor in one of your analyses, but not the others. And just whether there's any views on that. That was three rapid, <laughs> rapid fire questions there. <laughs> Um, so, so, so I think on the, on the question of, of HIV testing, I think this is very heavily debated on the laboratory testing group. In fact, you know, what, what can we use our gene expert machines for TB diagnosis for, for COVID? And there was a very strong push and, and from government and from, you know, that, that we can't weaken our HIV testing services and our, our TB services. But in fact, what, what weakened the services was not, so it wasn't the availability of laboratory testing. It was much more the fact that people didn't come into clinics. There was a lockdown. Um, Etc. So, so I think there has been a, and, and remember that South Africa is quite unique in that the, the public sector has one national laboratory uh, provider, the National Health Laboratory Service provides 80% of all diagnostics in, in South Africa. And so we were providing the COVID diagnostics and the HIV and TB diagnostics. And there was a, a lot of care taken to make sure that the HIV and TB diagnostics um, continued and a lot of debate about that. Because I, th I think that, the, you know, I didn't have time to go into it, but 
you can see that the mortality of HIV and TB is, is really, it's, it's this unseen epidemic. And in a way, but you, you know, obviously there are many reasons why, why there's a different social response to, to COVID, um, but, but it, certainly there is an awareness in South Africa that we can't compromise those, those services, although it's potentially a, a risk, but up until now that hasn't been allowed to occur. I think in terms of liver disease, um, Maybe a data issue. I'm not sure. You know, one would think a biological factor like liver disease would would uh, have a similar effect. And Charles may may want to to comment. And then in, in the active TB, um, I think it, it could be a power issue. Um, the, the numbers of, of TB infected cases are much smaller than the HIV. The prevalence of, of TB in the population is is lower. Um, and so so it's it's possible. I think it's it's. You know, TB is one even more so than HIV. It is highly probable that you know the the, the site of infection is the lungs, um, and so so it's highly probable that there isn't an interaction. I um, mean, it may just be that in the in the Western Cape data set, they, they didn't perhaps have the power, um, but it could also be about this differentiation between active and chronic TB. Et cetera. I think we need more data to understand uh, that that better. Okay, great. Now we are running out of time. Apologies. I know there's some more uh, questions here, but if it's all right with the two of you, we'll just liaise by email. Um, so I just want to thank, if you stay on the line, Cheryl and Charles, we can have a quick uh, mop up at the end, but I'm just going to close the session now and just remind people to please pass on the YouTube link if anybody's missed it. It's on the Usher Institute website. This was an excellent webinar. A sincere thanks to both our expert speakers. Um, and apologies again for the limited amount of time. So do pass on that YouTube link so others can view it. Um, what we're going to do now is we're taking a slight pause after 15 webinars over 15 successive weeks. At the moment, I'm liaising with speakers uh, from Germany, Australia, India, and also a number of other countries to secure speaker slots from mid to late August onwards. And the other one I'm looking at closely will be presenting new data on black and minority ethnic communities and COVID-19 in the UK and elsewhere. So if you have specific suggestions uh, for future webinars, please email me or the Usher Comms team uh, with your suggestions, particularly if you have contacts with the speakers, I very much welcome that. It makes um, uh, getting in touch with them easier. And also I forgot to thank Professor Harry Campbell at the beginning, who very kindly introduced Cheryl uh, to, to me. And I know that Harry and Cheryl have collaborated in the past. So please do rejoin us in August. We'll send out emails uh, telling you when the webinars are set up again. I'm very grateful to everybody who's participated, who's spoken and who's sent in their questions. So we'll close the webinar now and thanks again.